Time is more valuable than money. In fact, you might start your notes with that. Time is more valuable than money. You can get more money, but unfortunately you can't get more time. If somebody asks you to spend your money, that's pretty easy, right? We live in America, we're wealthy, so the money's not the problem. But what if somebody asks you to spend a day, right? You got to think that over carefully. And I know you did. I wouldn't waste one of my days, not for anybody, not for anything. Once I understood how valuable they were, I don't waste any. But uh, to make an investment like today of your money and your time, I appreciate that. Today's gonna be costly for me. It's gonna cost me one of my days to be here, right? And some money, of course, but you know, I don't need the money. I take the money, but I, I, don't, I don't need the money. But guess what I do need? The time. So I'm here not to just joke with you. I'm here not to just tell some funny stories and give a performance and walk away. I'm here to give you some value. And I want to make it worth your time. Uh, I'm going to invest a day. You're going to invest a day. Let's get the most out of it and see what we can walk away with today. Anyway, for you that have not seen me before, just very briefly, let me just tell you my story. I grew up in Idaho, farm country, southwest corner of Idaho. In fact, my father still lives on the old homestead where I grew up. Uh, he'll be 89 his next birthday, still hasn't retired. I'm proud of my dad. He's never been ill, he's really something. I'm trying to get him to retire this year, 88. I'm telling my father, what a good year to retire when you're 88. And he says, hey, talk to me in 10 years, right? I might be ready. But anyway, I went to high school, I graduated. I went to college one year. Halfway through my second year of college, I decided I was smart enough, so I quit. One of my major mistakes, I should have stayed in school. Uh, but I thought, heck, you know, I'm smart enough to get a job. That's what life's all about, right? Get a job, pay your bills, work hard, stay out of trouble, keep your fingers crossed, hope for the best. And I figured I was at least prepared to do that. So I quit college and uh, went to work. A little while later, got married, got my little family going, and I'm out there doing what I thought was the best I could. But about age 25, I'm starting to struggle. I've purchased a little more than I can conveniently pay for on time. And the creditors are starting to call saying, hey, you told us the check was in the mail. What's the deal? And I'm getting embarrassed by that. I'm also embarrassed, big mouth me, with all the fancy promises I made to get married. I'm way behind on those promises. And I'm getting discouraged, wondering what to do. And I thought, well, maybe I should go back to school. Right, one year of college, pretty short on an application. But uh, you know, tough to go back to school, right? Especially when you got your family going. Time to stay is when you're there. Uh, so I discounted that. I thought, well, if I, you know, had my own business, that would be the way to go. But you know, I'm short on money. Too much month at the end of the money. If you've ever been there? That's where I was, age 25. So I had to discount that, and I'm discouraged, wondering where do I go from here. And then the miracle happened for me. Good fortune came my way. And who can explain good fortune? I don't know. Remarkable things that happen to you at a particular time. Sometimes it's just unexplainable how those things happen. One of my friends says, well, hey, things don't just happen. Things happen just. Another good note for your notes. Things don't just happen. Things happen just. And maybe that's it. I don't know. I'm an amateur on life. I guess like most of us are trying to figure it out, how to make it valuable. But I was ready. And my good fortune was at age 25, I met a very wealthy man. His name was Mr. Schoff, Mr. Earls. A friend of mine had gone to work for him and he started telling me about this man. He said, you got to meet this man I've gone to work for. He's wealthy, but he's easy to talk to. Uh, and he's got a unique philosophy of life. And the more he kept talking about this man, I thought, well, I've got to meet this man. So sure enough, shortly after that, I had a chance to meet this remarkable wealthy man, and I was impressed. He was wealthy. Sure enough, he was easy to talk to. I was so intrigued, within a few minutes, I said to myself, if I could be like him, farm boy from Idaho, if I could be like him, I'd give anything. And then I thought, if I could just get around somebody like him, and if he would teach me what to do. 
I would be willing to learn. I'm, I'm coachable. And that was my good fortune. A few months later, this wealthy man that I met, Mr. Schoff, took a liking to me, hired me, gave me a job, I went to work for him, and I spent the next five years in his employ. And then unfortunately he died at the end of that period, at age 49. His last five years, but the first five years of my new life, I got to spend with this remarkable man, and my dream came true. He coached me, he taught me. He taught me the books to read. He taught me the disciplines. He taught me the changes to make in my language and personality. And the things he shared with me during that five years literally changed my life, turned my life around, changed my income, changed my bank account, changed my future, changed everything. I've never been the same since that unique experience. And uh, I wish he was still alive today, Mr. Schoff. I'm sure if he was alive today, especially after this seminar, Idaho Farm Boy makes it to Dallas, Fort Worth, full house, standing room only. Uh, pretty awesome, I'm sure. If he was alive, I'd be calling him today saying, you won't believe what's happening to me. I've had a chance now to share with other people what you shared with me. But anyway, how I got here. Uh, 30 plus years ago, I was living in Beverly Hills, California. And one day a friend of mine, businessman friend, said, Jim, uh, would you, I'd like to have you come and share your story with my service club that I belong to, the Rotary Club. He said, I know your story, Idaho farm boy makes it to Beverly Hills. But he said, I think my club members would love to hear your story. He said, if I arranged one of our breakfast meetings, would you come tell your story? Just share a few thoughts. I said, okay. Uh, so I agreed to go give this breakfast talk. And guess what? They liked it. And my telephone rang. I got another call, got another call saying, we heard uh, you've given your story and shared some ideas. Would you come talk to our club? Talk to our club. First thing I know, I'm starting to devote a piece of my business time to giving these talks. And then one day, a uh, businessman who'd heard my talk, I think two or three times, approached me and said, would you come and share that story and some thoughts with my management and salespeople? So I got this little company going. And he said, if you'd come tell your story to my organization, he said, I'd be happy to pay you. And I thought, wow, wouldn't that be something? So I agreed to go do it, and I got paid. Little did I know, another fortune was waiting for me to translate my ideas into talks and speeches and seminars. Now I've written some books. It's on cassette tape. Now I get to travel around the world. Last year I was in Japan, Israel, Spain, uh, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, France. Germany, Canada, and now Dallas Forward. So. <laughs> Idaho farm boy gets to travel around the world and share his story, and here I am today. Anyway, it's almost too much for me to comprehend from where I started, raised in obscurity, uh, in a little small farm community, and now to be here today is pretty awesome for me. So anyway, that's just a little bit about my story. My story is probably more intriguing for me than it is for you, but I wanted to hear it again, so I thought I would just, you know, <laughs> bore you with it. Anyway, I don't ask you to be impressed today. I'm the one that's impressed from where I came from to have a chance. But that's the American dream, right? Come true. Chance to start from scratch, start from obscurity, start with pennies, start with nothing, and have a chance to transform your life, change your life, set your goals, and see what you can accomplish. So anyway, that's how I got here. And I'm just delighted that this day has arrived, and I truly want to make it valuable for you. Let's go to work. Here's what I hope you'll find out of this seminar today for your notes. Here's what I hope you'll find. Number one, sincerity. Above all else today, I hope you'll find me sincere. Best place for people to start to communicate is sincerity on both sides. I'm sure you're sincere or you wouldn't be here today, right? To spend this kind of money, to spend this kind of time, roll up your sleeves today, go to work like I am and get this message, uh, you've got to be sincere. So I assume you're sincere. Now I want you to see me sincere. But I've got a good note for you to make. Sincerity is not a test of truth. Important note to make. Sincerity is not a test of truth. We must not make the mistake of saying he must be right, he's so sincere. That would be a mistake. 
Here's why. It's possible to be sincerely wrong. So we don't mistake sincerity for truth, right? Sincerity is only a test of sincerity. Truth has to yet be tested by truth, okay? But hopefully you will find me sincere and truthful. Next, a combination of things I hope you'll find here today. Ideas plus inspiration. Ideas plus inspiration. Ideas, business ideas and social ideas and personal ideas, we all need ideas, right? How to have a good day, ideas. How to have a good year, ideas. How to have your best year ever, ideas. Good health, ideas. Personal relationship, ideas. How to deal with your family, ideas. Sales management, ideas. Financial freedom for the future, ideas. We all need good ideas. So today, I hope you gather up by notes and by what you can remember, a lot of ideas. I want to share as many with you as I possibly can in the time constraints we have. Today's going to go very rapidly. I used to think a day like this was a long day. Found out it's a pretty short day, but I'm going to go as fast as I can, share with you as many ideas as I possibly can. And here's why. Ideas can be life-changing. Ideas can be life-changing. Sometimes all you need is just one more in a series of good ideas. It's like dialing the numbers into the lock, right? You got five or six numbers dialed into the lock. The lock still won't come open, but you don't need five or six more numbers. Maybe you just need one more, and maybe a seminar like this could do it. A sermon could do it. The lyric from a song could do it. A dialogue from a movie could do it. A conversation with a friend might do it. That one last piece you need, number. Dial it into the lock, that's it. The lock comes open, there's the door for you to walk through. And maybe this seminar today could furnish that for you. One more idea. I know you've come with a lot already. Sometimes we get the impression, I used to have that, that I only had this much going for me and I needed this much. Usually not true. And I'm sure not true of this audience, where I find you today, as well dressed as you look today. You know, as fine as you are sitting here today, it isn't that, you know, you've got this much going for you and you need this much. I would assume you've got this much going for you and maybe all you need is just a few more thoughts, ideas uh, to furnish you some ways and means to turn your life into the dream you want it to be. So, ideas. The seminar is going to be loaded with ideas. I want you to take good notes. But here's what else I hope you'll find here today and that is inspiration. And who knows the mystery of inspiration? Why some people are inspired and some are not? You were inspired to get here, some were not. Who knows the mystery of that? I don't know. How come you made it? The rest of them didn't make it. We don't know what that mystery is. Some people turned it down. Some people said it costs too much. Some people said it's gonna to take too much time. Some people are too busy, right? A lot of different excuses why some are inspired to take advantage of something that comes to town. Others pass it up. We don't know the mystery to that. Here's what I call it, mysteries of the mind. And I just leave it at that. Some things I don't try to figure out. I take the simple approach now. Right? Some people do and some people don't. I mean, that's about as profound as my philosophy is. Some buy and some don't buy. Some go for it and some don't. Some change and some don't. And if you've been around for a while, you can usually work out the numbers, right? Out of 10, you know, three do, seven don't. Whatever business you're involved in, pretty soon you got this ratio going. The ones that do, the ones that don't. You say, well, why don't the ones that don't, how come they don't? We don't know. I just leave it as a mystery. I used to try to understand all that. I just take the simple approach now. The guy says, this happens to me, this happens to me, this goes wrong for me, and all this stuff goes wrong for me. How come all this stuff happens to me? I say, I don't know, it beats me. <laughs> the best I've been able to figure out is those kind of things always happen to people like you. I mean, right? <laughs> That's the best I got, I don't know. I'm an amateur on this stuff, what do I know? So, just take the simple approach, right? That's how it is. Who knows? Interesting story says, the day the Christian church was started. Now, I'm an amateur on the Bible, but best account I can remember, the day the Christian church was started, a magnificent sermon was preached. Great presentation. And if you're a student of all, at all, of good communication, it was one of the classic presentations of all times. The sermon, the first day the Christian church was started. And it said this sermon, this presentation was given to a multitude, meaning a lot of people. But it was interesting as the account 
gives us the record, it says when the sermon was finished, there was a variety of reaction to the same sermon. Isn't that fascinating? I find it fascinating. It said some that heard this presentation were perplexed. And I read the presentation, it sounded pretty straightforward to me. So why would somebody be perplexed with a good, sincere, straightforward presentation? Best answer I've got. They are the perplexed. I mean, you know, what other explanation is there? It doesn't matter who's preaching. It said some that heard this presentation mocked and laughed, made fun of the presentation. I thought, hey, this looks pretty sincere to me. If you give a sincere, honest presentation, why would somebody mock and laugh? Easy explanation. They are the mockers and the laughers. What else would you expect them to do? I used to try to straighten all that out, so they shouldn't do that. I don't do that anymore. I've got peace of mind now, I can sleep like a baby, not try to straighten all this stuff out. I used to be so naive, I used to say, well, liars shouldn't lie. See, how naive can you be? Of course, they're supposed to lie. That's why we call them liars. They lie, they lie. So I don't straighten this stuff out anymore. Anyway, it said some that heard this magnificent presentation didn't know what was going on. And they're usually easy to spot. They're usually saying, what's going on, right? I mean, they don't know what's going on. But interesting, right? A variety of reaction to the same sincere, honest presentation. Now, it also says in wrapping it up, some that heard the presentation believed. And I think that's who the speaker was looking for, the believers. Interesting. Now, it said the number of believers was about 3,000. So a pretty good first day. 3,000. I've had some first days, but I never had 3,000. But anyway, 3,000 were believers. And that's, the speaker was looking for the believers out of this multitude. And that's about as close as we can come to understanding the mystery. Some believe and some mock and some laugh and some are perplexed. And some don't know what's going on. And you just have to leave it that way. Why? Because that's the way it's going to be. The way to be brilliant is to find out how it's going to be and then say, here's how it should be. I mean, that's how you become brilliant. So, anyway, who knows the mystery? I call it the mysteries of the mind. We don't understand, but I don't try to change it anymore. On this particular story, as far as we know, they didn't have classes after the presentation to try to de-perplex the perplexed. I mean, as far as we know, they left them perplexed. They left the mockers mocking. They let the laughers laugh. I mean, they didn't come back and try to straighten all this out. You say, well, how can you build a church? Well, make another presentation and you'll get some believers and some mockers and some laughers and some who don't know what's going on. So that's about the best we can do. So, but I'm glad I've got the believers here today. You believed enough to shell out your cash and part with your time and some of your effort and energy. And I appreciate that. So hopefully you'll find some inspiration here today. All right. To get the most out of today, a couple more notes. Number one, be thankful. That's a good way to capture the most of a day like this. Be thankful for what you already have. That shouldn't be any problem in America, being thankful. Everything we need is available in America. Everybody wants to come here, right? The last time I was here, that little presentation I gave, everybody wants to come here, America. People haven't plotted and schemed the last 40 years, saying if I could just get to Poland, everything would be okay. <laughs> No, everybody wants to come to America. Why? Everything's available here. All the books you need, all the sermons you need, all the churches you need, all the schools you need, all the instruction you need, all the inspiration you need, all the capital you need, all the markets you need, all the challenge you need, all the information you need, all the seminars you need. Everything's available here. This is America. So number one, let's be thankful for what we already have. Thanksgiving does this. Opens up the doors, opens up the windows, opens up the channels. Thanksgiving for what you already have. I did a seminar one weekend up at the ranch, up at Clear Lake. Got a lodge up there. Nice setting, high valley, high serenity ranch. For the weekend, Friday evening, Saturday, Sunday. People drove in from around California. I got there late Friday afternoon. Everybody had pretty well already gotten there. I couldn't believe the parking lot. Continentals and Eldorados and Mercedes and Cadillacs and unbelievable. Ferrari, one Rolls Royce, unbelievable. I walked in, good looking crowd about like this, sitting there ready for the weekend seminar. My opening remarks were, ladies and gentlemen, I think the rest of the world would find it strange 
that we have all come here this weekend to try to figure out how to do better. Right? I think the rest of the world would say, I don't understand. Guy in his Rolls Royce saying, I got to get to the seminar, find out how to get another one of these Rolls Royces. <laughs> Unbelievable. Anyway, let's be thankful. Here's what locks up the doors and the channels to receive more cynicism. That locks you away. That prevents you from learning more, being a cynic about the past and the future, a cynic about the marketplace, cynical about the people, cynical about the institutions, cynical about the setup, cynical about yourself, cynical about your chances. See, that locks away all the chance for stuff to flow your way. So, good advice, I think, today. Start off, be thankful. Here's number two, listen well. And that's going to be a challenge today, I understand that. Seems like most of, you know, our life is still going on outside these four walls, right? Most of our life seems like it's all, you know, continuing out there. Family and business and associates and market and economy and whatever else is happening in the midst of your life. And to sort of, you know, pull your attention from what's going on out there and put it in here for just a few hours, I know is a challenge. But do the best you can, listen well. And here's the last one, take good notes. Be a good student today, take some good notes. I've not come to entertain you. As you can tell by my opening joke, right? I would not make it in Las Vegas. So we don't have a dog and pony show today, no entertainment. But I do have some ideas. Take some good notes. Somebody showed me the other day notes that they took about 21 years ago attending one of my seminars out in Los Angeles. He said, I still use these notes I took 21 years ago to help me in my business, relationship with my family. So I'd like to have these notes that you take today become that valuable for you. Then it would be worth me making the investment to come and spend a portion of my life my time, my energy here. And I want this investment I'm making here today to pay off. And one of the ways it can pay off for me is for you to take good notes and then go away and use whatever makes sense. Because what I feast on coming back around is the stories out of this audience today. Sure enough, six weeks from now, six months from now, six years from now, somebody's going to by phone, by letter, by personal contact, walk up to me and say, the things you shared that day got me thinking and I started making some changes and let me tell you what's happened to my business. Let me tell you what's happened to my sales career. Let me tell you what's happened to my relationship with my family. See, that'll make it worth it for me. Not the money, the return. Something you can't buy with money. If somebody says, thank you for touching my life and taking the time to make the investment. And that's what I'm all about. So if you'll become a good student today. And here's the last note. Don't be a follower, be a student. You'll be happy to know today we haven't come seeking disciples. We've got no movement for you to join. I'm just here to share some of my experiences, good ideas, best I can. But I think that's good advice. Don't be a follower, be a student, right? Take advice, but not orders. Take information, but don't let somebody, you know, order your life. Make sure what you do is the product of your own conclusion excellent note to make make sure what you do is the product of your own conclusion not to do what someone else says take what someone else says process it think about it ponder it if it makes you wonder if it makes you think then it's valuable then when you go take action make sure that the action is not what somebody told you to do make sure the action is the product of your own conclusion if you'll follow just a little bit of those Simple guidelines I'm telling you the learning process can be speedy swift powerful Your learning curve can go up and then applying it to your business your life your family Conversations equities of all kinds you'll find some progress like I did that first five years When I met a teacher willing to share with me turn my life around Progress I couldn't believe happened for me Okay What's blocking your growth? Victoria and I were in another city walking through a park and it was full of these huge cactus plants They stood over 30 feet tall and all kinds of incredible shapes I was amazed at not only how beautiful they were, but how big they were As we continued through the park enjoying all the sights We came to a group of cactus that looked the same type as the large cactus But they were only about my height. I went over to them and looked closer 
trying to figure out why they were so much shorter. I said to Victoria, they must be a different kind. She looked up and said, no, Joel, it's that tree. There was this large oak tree and its branches were keeping the sun from hitting these cactus. What's interesting is they have the same potential as the cactus that were 30 feet tall. They're in the same soil, same climate, same weather conditions. The only difference was something was blocking their growth. And because they're constantly in the shade, they're only a fraction of what they were created to be. And I wonder if something is blocking your growth. Are you under the shade of what someone spoke over you, told you what you couldn't do, how you're not that talented, now that shade is limiting your life? Are you under the shade of intimidation, afraid to step out in faith, thinking of all the things that could go wrong? Do you have friends that are blocking your growth, causing you to compromise, do things that are holding you back? What could you become if you got out from under that shade? How high could you go if you made some adjustments? The good news is the potential is still in you. You can still become who you were created to be. You just have to get out from under that shade. Remove what's blocking your growth and you'll begin to blossom. You'll go to new levels. There's nothing wrong with you. You have the life of Almighty God in you. He created you to rise higher, to be successful, confident, to leave your mark. One thing that can easily stunt our growth is the people that we're spending time with. You need to evaluate your friendships, the people you're eating lunch with at the office, the neighbor you're hanging out with. Are they making your life better, pushing you higher, inspiring you to reach your dreams? Or are they causing you to compromise, be mediocre, take the easy way out? You're going to become like the people you continually associate with. The scripture says, don't hang around angry people or you will become angry. It says, when you walk with wise people, you will become wise. If you want to know what you're going to be like in five years, look at your friends. If they gossip, complain about the boss, unfaithful in relationships, hard to get along with, do yourself a favor, find some new friends. Spirits are transferable. If your friends gossip, that spirit of gossip will get off on you. If your friends are critical, that critical spirit will end up on you. If your friends run around on their spouse, that unfaithful spirit will start to tempt you. You may not realize it, but they're blocking your growth. They're limiting your potential. It's not their fault. You have to make a change. Well, Joel, what if I hurt their feelings? What if they get upset? What if you miss your destiny? What if they keep you a five-foot cactus, so to speak, instead of the 30-foot cactus that you were created to be? How high could you rise if you weren't being shaded by compromise, by mediocrity? I know you love your friends, but your destiny is too great. Your assignment too important to hang around people that are not adding to your life. You need people that bring out the best in you, people that inspire you to do better, to challenge you to live a life of excellence and integrity. Some of the trouble and heartache we find ourselves in, if we look back, we knew we were supposed to make a change, but we didn't do it. We didn't want to rock the boat. We didn't want to upset people. But what you're not willing to walk away from is where you'll stop growing. God is saying to you, you are a mighty hero. You are destined to leave your mark. But you have to make the choice like Gideon. Are you going to stay in the shade, hiding in the wine press, thinking you don't have what it takes? Or are you going to step into your greatness? Are you going to believe that you're a mighty hero, equipped, empowered, and anointed? How high can you go if you'll just get rid of what's blocking your growth? Limited mindsets. I mean, people pulling you down. <laughs> Friendships that are holding you back. God has a big destiny for you. There are things in your future greater than you've imagined, but there will always be dream stealers, naysayers, people that try to pull you into their shade. They're insecure. They'll try to talk you into being insecure. 
You really think you can go to college? You really think you can start that business? You really think you're going to beat that sickness? They live intimidated. They'll try to pull you into intimidation, fear, doubt. Don't take the bait. Stay in the sun. God is going to cause you to blossom, to go places no one ever thought you could go. It's going to surprise your family. People are going to be amazed at where God takes you. I just got to tell you, you've got to chase that dream before you die, man. You should go and live your dream. Listen, man, like I told all my kids, all my kids have a college education. I told them all, I don't care what you get a degree in. Until you follow your dream and connect it to your gift, you'll never be happy. Thank you. You'll never be happy, man. I just got to tell you, you've got to chase that dream before you die, man. You should go and live your dream. Just go see. God puts your real life in your imagination. That's where your real, your real life ain't in your present circumstance. Your real life is not in your current situation. Your real life is not in your paycheck. Your real life, he tucks it away in your imagination. Albert Einstein said, imagination is everything. It's a preview to life's coming attractions. Everything you imagine is a preview to a coming attraction. Once you understand that and quit looking at your imagination as hocus pocus, it opens up a wide range of things and possibilities. And God puts your real life in your imagination. Listen to me. This is serious what I'm telling you. Don't you think it's nothing else? Imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. That simply means everything that's in your imagination is a preview of a coming attraction that God has for you. That's why he puts it in your imagination. That's why when you tell your imagination to the wrong people, it don't go nowhere. You ever had something you thought was a brilliant idea and you took it in there to your family and your loved ones and they shot it down? You know why they shot it down? Because they couldn't see it. Because God didn't put it in their imagination. He put it in your imagination. If you want to kill a big dream, tell it to a small-minded person. It'll just die. I walked in that house, man, and told everybody I was quitting my job to go be a comedian. Everybody in that house shot that down. My mama shot it down. All my friends shot it down. My brothers and sisters shot it down. Don't you quit your job, go be no comedian. You can't make no money telling no jokes like that. It's 1985, who you think you are? If I had listened to them, I wouldn't even be here today. But I didn't listen because it was evidently clear to me. God had put it in my imagination that one day I would be on stage. But if I had listened to my mother, who was saved and a Christian and a Sunday school teacher. If I had listened to her, I wouldn't have quit my job. All my brothers, everybody told me, you can't go be no comedian. I left anyway. I won amateur night on October 8th, 1985, won 50 bucks. I went to work the next day, October 9th, 1985, quit my job. Everybody in my neighborhood called me a fool. You gotta chase that dream before you die, man. Bishop Jake said one time, Bishop Jake said, I would hate to die and never do the thing I was born to do. You shouldn't let that happen.